Okay, this is uh, lecture four in uh, Emergent States of Matter. And uh, we're now going to get down to brass text. So we're going to start off uh, looking at um, some, of, uh, some of the fundamental ideas of emergent states and long range order. So uh, we're going to start off uh, straight away by uh, looking at what happens in a magnet, in an analyzing magnet. We're going to introduce some of the basic ideas of long range order. We're going to introduce the idea of how to do functional integration. And then we're going to start talking about systems with uh, different uh, symmetry groups. So let me just start off by sort of saying what the goal of this uh, section is. So what we want to introduce is the idea of uh, long range order. I want to relate that to the idea of a coarse grained uh, descriptions of systems. And that's going to take us to something that's, uh, that's uh, called um, Landau, Landau theory. Uh, I want to introduce some basic uh, technical tools. So we're going to talk about uh, functional uh, integration, which sounds fancy, but it's really very simple. And, uh, and we're going to um, eventually get to, not today of course, but we will get to the ideas of um, uh, systems with different uh, symmetry groups, particularly continuous symmetries. So um, the, the, what we're going to do is start off uh, with these rather general things, and then we're going to switch to looking at uh, specific systems, namely uh, liquid helium uh, in its superfluid phases and the Bose-Einstein condensates. And then uh, later in the semester, we will um, use the same ideas that we're introducing now to uh, look at um, things like the excitation spectrum. So, uh, so what I want to say is that ultimately, uh, what we uh, anticipate uh, being able to do is we want to um, ex explore the uh, generic consequences of spontaneous breaking of continuous symmetries. And, uh, and what we're going to see is that the following things are basically a generic. We're going to see that there is the acquisition of generalized rigidity. We're going to see that there is um, a set of low-lying excitations, uh, which are fairly generic. So we'll say the presence of low-lying excitations. We're going to see that uh, we can get the uh, possibility of topological defects. And uh, we're going to see, not, not soon, but later, how this is associated with the, uh, with the presence of transverse power law correlations. In the ordered phase. And, uh, and we're going to see that this gives rise to a generalized elasticity theory. And we'll construct that in, in, in simple cases. So 
uh, that's what we ultimately uh, want to do. Um, what we're going to be doing uh, primarily is uh, we will, we will um, before we do that, what we're going to be doing is initially see how these ideas emerge in a specific system. And the uh, and that example is going to be um, a superfluid helium. And uh, and uh, Bose Einstein condensates. So I kind of think that um, it's a mistake to go from the general to the specific. I'd rather go from the specific to the general. So uh, until you've seen uh, how these things emerge in the real physical system, um, I, I think it's um, not good practice to start off with some general mathematical theory and then see it instantiated. I want you to understand why we develop that, uh, that general theory. So let's, uh, let's, um, let's, let's take a start. So, so part one, and what we're going to, what we're going to talk about now uh, is something very simple, uh, which, you, which you've all seen, uh, which is the, uh, the, the um, case of a magnet with discrete symmetries. And that's just going to be an Ising model. Okay, so hopefully you've all seen this before. <clears throat> if you if you haven't, then it's going to be um, it's going to be challenging, but this is a prerequisite for the course. So the model that we're going to think about is a model for the liquid gas transition. And it's also a model for the paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition in spin half systems. So the, the so the picture that we're going to have is is a is a is a, is a lattice in the d dimensions, and uh, on that lattice we're going to have um, i equals one up to n uh, lattice points, and uh, on the vertices of the lattice we're going to put spins that can take the value plus or minus one, and the Hamiltonian for the system is just the nearest neighbor Ising model Hamiltonian, so I'm going to write it like this. So that's the that's Hamiltonian. And the thing that we're always going to be interested in is the magnetization. So let's uh, talk about that. So we, we want to know uh, how to quantify the order. And so our answer is, is that we measure the, the magnetization, which we'll define as this. So n is 1 over n, sum from i equals 1 to n of uh, si. And, uh, and what, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what do you know? Uh, and when, we, when I write down uh, expectation value, uh, what I always mean is 1 over z trace of whatever is in there, e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian. And uh, the trace operation in this particular case is just the sum of S1 is plus or minus 1, sum S2 is plus or minus 1, all the way up to Sn is plus or minus 1. So that's, uh, that's how we uh, define our thermal uh, expectation values. So what does it look like? So 
if we if we plot um, as a function of temperature, and this is this is a picture that we saw uh, already um, in our introductory lectures. Excuse me, one second. Just pad here just to rest my hand on. So uh, what this looks like. It comes down something like this. This is a TC point zero up here, and it's it's uh, it's scaled so that um, the axes go from zero to one. And here I'm just drawing m in the in the positive uh, in the positive direction. Um, and so this is the picture that people always say is this is what we mean by uh, spontaneous magnetization. For temperatures less than Tc, and uh, and this picture is uh, is one you've seen before, and it's obviously completely wrong. Okay, it's impossible for this to happen. So let's uh, let's uh, let's just see why that's the case. So what then the reason is is that for every spin configuration that I want to write down, and I'm going to use uh, that notation to denote uh, all of the the spin vectors. So I'm just going to write it down like that. Um, for every spin configuration that is included in the thermal expectation value uh, uh, of, of M, so let's call this configuration um, you know, S star, um, there is another configuration which I'll write as minus S star that is also included in the spin, in the, in, in the, in the configuration. So basically, um, th th this configuration with, 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 with S star and the configuration with minus S star, both of those uh, fall in to this thermal expectation value over here. And, uh, and um, it would be better if I did that. Uh, both of them fall into this, uh, this, uh, this expectation value that you can see on the left. And so uh, what that means is that when I add them all up, it must be that the expectation value of M is equal to zero for all temperatures. And uh, when I write down this, this uh, symbol here, this means for all. Okay. So, so that's, that's kind of disturbing. The first thing I've told you is that you can't have actually have uh, phase transitions and therefore and you can't have emergence so we should all go home well uh, not not so fast so so how do we um, avoid this catastrophic conclusion And, um, and and so the, the answer is that uh, this conclusion is actually correct in, uh, in, in, in in everything that I've said. So so the answer is everything is correct. Everything is correct in what we said. There is no emergence. And there's no phase transitions. But there's a but. And, uh, and the but is this. It's 
something in this in this argument is wrong. And any, anybody care to guess what what is wrong about in this argument? What is the what is the what is the escape clause? Regardicity. So so yes, we we've, we've assumed ergodicity, but and I, I I know you know whether that I'm going in the direction of talking about ergodicity breaking because I yeah, is, you've seen that in the notes, but but we're, but at a, at a more basic level, where where what mistake have we not mistake, but what have we forgotten about? What have we forgotten to take into account? The source term. Well, we when I'm when I'm doing this, we're we're. We're setting h is equal to zero. I should have said that. Correlations. Well, we've no, we, we've included them in this argument. They're not going to change this argument. This argument is a, is purely a symmetric a symmetry argument, right? So it's, it's hard to see how it could be wrong. So what, what, what we've said is this term, we don't have to worry about it. We're talking about everything here is as h equals zero. So the reason, the reason why it's not true is that we've assumed that the Boltzmann distribution is the correct distribution, but in fact, it's not, okay? So, so what I want to say is that this argument and you can make this argument more precise. You can, you can, we'll do, we will do it in a, in a, in a symmetry way. Uh, in, 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 in a, uh, you can do it in a symmetry way in another way, just simply calculate the expectation value with this Hamiltonian. And basically because this term here is a, is a, is a bilinear term, then what that means is that when you compute uh, the expectation value of a single, a single variable, it has to give you zero by symmetry. So, so, so this argument. So we'll say about something about that in a minute. So, we'll, but this argument assumes um, that the probability distribution of states is the Boltzmann distribution. And it's not, at least it's not if you have a infinite system. So that's true for finite systems. And it's not necessarily true for infinite systems. So let's talk. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, why that's true. So first thing I want to just make sure that we that we, that we under, that you, you understand uh, where you know another another part of this of this argument. So uh, so let me just make this comment that when um, when h is equal to zero. In the in, in the uh, original Hamiltonian of the system, so there's no external field, then we have a symmetry. So if I take the Hamiltonian as a function of all the spins, so I write it like that, and if I then um, replace every spin with its negative. So let's call that let's call that operation uh, time reversal symmetry. So we'll call it operation T. Then under that under that symmetry, the, the this acting on the Hamiltonian that is H of minus S. And you can see from the Hamiltonian H is equal to minus J sum over I and J S I. Sj, and if I replace both of them, both of the spins with a minus sign, then I get the I get the I get the same thing back because the two minuses cancel. So what we've learned is that the Hamiltonian 
of the system is the same as the Hamiltonian of the system with all the spins flipped. And so, so we can say that the uh, Hamiltonian is invariant under the operation T, and we call T time reversal symmetry. So this is a time reversal symmetry. Now we call it time reversal symmetry for a stupid reason. It's simply this, the spins are flipping and, and the system is in equilibrium. So in equilibrium, there is no notion of time really, in, at least in equilibrium statistical mechanics. So when we think of time reversal, we think of a spin being up now being uh, flipped. So we can think of this as, a, as time reversal symmetry. A better way to think about this would be permutation symmetry. And, uh, this, and the permutation symmetry group is, in this case has a name, it's called Z2, it's just this permutation of, two, of, a, of a group of two objects. So we can think of this as, as Z2 or time reversal symmetry. So the Hamiltonian is, is invariant under that. And so when I, if I have the, when I compute the expectation value of M, so that's the one over the partition function, the trace of the sum over i e to the minus beta h of all the spins like this. Oh, uh, by the way, I didn't say this over here, but I should have done. Let me let me let me be clear. When I say z, that just means the trace of the Boltzmann factor. That's just the normalization. Okay, so when I when I compute this, so what you can see is that is that this object here uh, is uh, goes goes to minus itself under 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 t and this thing over here the hamiltonian is invariant under t so basically what this this object is this is like in integrating um, x from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus something like x squared. Okay, if you had that integral to do, you would say, oh, I know that has to be uh, zero because this is an odd function and this is an even function. And so I have to get zero. And so that's why the magnetization is always equal to zero if you have the, the uh, Boltzmann distribution. So, the, so what we've concluded then is that the, the only way for the expectation value of M to not be zero is if the probability distribution is not the Boltzmann distribution And the only way that that can happen is that, is that you must have some infinite system and why do we why do I say must well I'm going to explain that to you now so the so if, if so so in, in other words, in a finite system, you cannot have emergent order. At least for non-zero temperature. Okay, so let's 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 now see where this comes from. And this is the this is the this is the thing that Quan uh, Sen mentioned in answer to my question, and that is this idea of uh, ergodicity. So now we need to, uh, to understand this claim. Let's think about the ergodicity.
So our picture of, of statistical mechanics is the following, that in statistical mechanics, what we can do is we can replace a time average by an average over a probability distribution. And the, the way that that, that works is, is literally something like this, that if I want to know uh, the expectation value of the magnetization that I, I'm measuring, the way that I would measure this in a lab is I would take, um, I would take them, I would measure the magnetization at time t, and then I would integrate it from naught to some tau, integrate over, over, over t like that, and divide by, by tau, and then take the limit as the, as the measurement time goes to infinity. So this is what I would literally do in, in a lab. This is a time average. And then what uh, ergodicity allows us to do is to replace this by the, by the, the um, expectation value of M with, uh, with this particular, particular weighting. And, and, and that um, is the idea that we have some kind of uh, ergodicity in the system. And so the idea is that the system uh, visits every point in space or near every point in space. And so uh, we, 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 when we're averaging over those states, we weight them by their, by their energy in the way that the Boltzmann distribution tells us to do. And so uh, that is, is the basis for, the, for, for, this, um, for this claim. So let's, let's have a look at what ergodicity really means. So what I'm drawing here is a, is a state space. Or a more or more generally phase space, and the uh, and and so every point in this space represents the configuration of all of the spins in the system. So it's it's a, it's a in this case it's an n-dimensional space where n is the number of spins. Uh, it would be um, in, in another system, it would be a six n-dimensional system if, if, if it's a particle system, for example. And so what the system is doing is, is it is moving between, uh, between different states. So one point in this space represents the configuration of all of the spins. And so what the system does over time is it wanders through this, this space and makes some uh, tra trajectory like that. And that's the, that's the picture uh, of the system uh, in, 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 in time. Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to uh, differentiate uh, the states by their macroscopic properties. So I'm going to draw a sort of dashed line in the space and I'm going to say that all the states up here, if I were to measure the magnetization of them, it would be a positive number. And if I were to measure the magnetization in these states, it would be a negative number. So that's the picture of the system and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. And this is true uh, when n is less than infinity. Now what happens when, when I have a, a infinite system? So I'm going to just show you the answer and then I'm going to tell you uh, why it is like that. So here is our, here is our, uh, our phase space like so. Uh, here is my um, division of the states to n greater than zero and n less than zero. And now what, what happens in this case is that the system uh, makes its trajectory, but it only uh, lives in uh, one part of phase space. It only lives in that part over there. So if I start off over here, at that point, then the system forever stays there with a positive magnetization and never enters into the part of phase space where M uh, is negative. And so this is the picture when the system is infinite. Now, of course, I could also have started the system uh, at, say, this point over here where n is negative. And if I had done that, 
then it would have wandered around in this space and it would have stayed in this part of the of the phase space rather than the other part. So, so what we say then is that over, over here, so for n uh, less than infinity, uh, the system is ergodic over all of space, all of phase space. And when n is equal to infinity, uh, the system breaks ergodicity. And, uh, and that's what we mean by saying that it uh, only lives in one part of the space or the other. Now, why is it, why is it like that? Well, this is something that, that I hope uh, you, you recall from uh, my equilibrium statistical mechanics class. Um, and, and, and so uh, the, the reason for this is loosely uh, the, the following. Uh, the time uh, taken for the system to reach um, the part of phase space where m is negative, given that it started in the region of phase space where m is positive, that time uh, is, is roughly something like that. Tau from positive to negative is something that scales like e to some constant times the number of degrees of freedom in the system to the power d minus 1 over d. So, so what you can see is that this is, this is basically the lifetime of staying in the n greater than 0 part of space. And, and you can see that this, this goes very rapidly uh, to infinity as I take the limit n goes to infinity. What, um, what assumptions are we making about the dynamics of the system? So this would be true in any, any kind of um, sort of spin flip spin flip dynamics like you know Kawasaki dynamic uh, like the Glauber dynamics for example where the spins can flip um, so so that you can you can write down a stochastic process that says that that spins in a certain time interval have a certain time to, to, to flip mm -hmm. so, do we need to assume that like the the moves are local only like we flip flip our spins one by one or something um, Yes, in, in a sense you do, because it, this is true if the, if, the, if, the, if the dynamics is physical. You could make unphysical dynamics, which would still sample states, and, and, and that would be some Markov process could, that could still have the equilibrium distribution that you want, but it would be unphysical. Yeah, so I guess what, what is so, physical? So we, are, so we are assuming that, that I, mean, I mean, in the Ising model, it's a little bit tricky because there isn't actually an equation of motion, which is something right. I'm glossing over. And uh, so, so, so although I'm talking about it here for the Ising model, so I'm assuming that we've prescribed some dynamics, say like time-dependent Ginsburg-Landau dynamics or, or, or Glauber dynamics, um, that, that's, what, that's really what I, what I have in mind. Okay. Okay. So, so the, the, the reason for this picture, so uh, I hope most of you have seen this before, uh, I know you have if you've taken my, my class. So the basic, the, the, the way you can derive this, I'm not going to derive it now, but the, 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 the reason uh, comes from the fact that um, you, you can work out what is the rate at which you go over some uh, potential barrier, um, like, whoops, if you, if, you, if, you, if you want to know what happens, if you start off here and uh, 
and go over some uh, potential barrier to go from a metastable minimum to a, a global minimum. So, so the, uh, the, the rate at which you go over uh, is, is given by the, the, um, the energy, the activation energy over KBT, that's the Arrhenius law. And, uh, um, and, uh, and I may give this to you as a homework exercise for those of you who want to, who want to, to, to check this. So what, what happens is what this factor over here is doing, th this thing here is essentially saying that I'm looking at a system which um, I'm going to call this uh, rate. What, what actually you're looking at is, is the, the, the rate of going from one state to another is a, is a nucleation process. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the rate is controlled by the critical nucleus. So, so R less than R star, the, the, um, new, the we call this phase A and this phase B, um, B uh, will shrink. And if R is greater than some critical radius, B will grow into the background. Of the A phase, and that is is the is how a phase transition occurs, a, a first order phase transition. That's how it occurs, and you can then, from this formula here, then work out what happens um, when the um, external magnetic field the um, the the delta e reflects the balance between bulk energy and surface energy. So let me just unpack that for you. <coughs> so if you start off with in in a in a state a which we would call a metastable state. And you're transitioning to a state B, which we'll call the global minimum. Then, um, then the, the reason that you would make that transition is if, the, if B has a lower energy per unit volume than A, which it does clearly in the picture that I've drawn here. But if I were to try to work out what is the free energy cost of putting a bubble of, of B phase in a background of A phase. So I start off in A and then try to make a little bubble of, of B in that phase. That little bubble will not grow unless it is able to overcome the barrier, create the surface energy of this boundary between the B and the A phase. That's the surface energy. And so if, so for small systems, the surface energy will dominate over the uh, bulk energy. So that's what I mean by, by this here. When, when the surface energy is smaller than the bulk energy, then that, that's true for large radi a large enough radius. And then this droplet of the B phase and the A phase will, will grow. So, that's, so this, is the, this is a picture for the kinetics of a first order transition. And why do you say who cares about first order transitions? Well, you care about a first order transition because when you look at the original Hamiltonian, which we have all the way over here, when H is non-zero, then you have a first order transition between the states. You literally have 
an external magnetic field biases the state. So if you have a magnetic field in the in the plus z direction, it will bias the system to being um, pointing in the plus z direction. And so when when we're talking about spontaneous symmetry breaking, what we're actually asking is what happens when we have the external field going to zero. And so when this picture that I've drawn up at the top here, when I, when I take um, h goes to zero in this picture, what happens is that I get um, I get I get something like this. And so this is the picture when h is equal to zero. This is the picture when h is not equal to zero. And those two phases, a and b, are just the plus phase and the minus phase. So you can work this out. And, and, and after you've learned about Landau theory, you'll be able to do this calculation. And you'll see that you get, uh, you'll get exactly this expression here. So the why you get the n to the d minus 1 to the, over the d power, that's because the surface energy scales as um, you know, the, the radius to the power d minus 1. So if d is 3, that would be 4 pi r squared times some, some uh, surface tension. The bulk energy scales like some energy density uh, times r to the d. And so it's the competition between these things that give rise to the factor n to the d minus 1 over d. OK, so that's, that's a very brief way of, being, of telling you how I derived this formula. And, and, you, and I'll let you work it out yourself uh, later in, 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 a, in, a, in a homework set or in office hour or something like this. So let's just look at the consequences of this. What this, going back to, going back to the left panel, so what that literally then tells you is that the lifetime of, of a phase uh, grows as n goes to infinity. And so you literally get trapped uh, in, into one, you get trapped into uh, your, into an ergodic region. So when h is greater than zero, you don't have that. When h is equal to zero, you have this phenomenon, and this phenomenon is, is known as ergodicity breaking. Could I ask a quick question? Sure. Is the partition between m equal m larger than zero and m less than zero unique? I mean, could we partition the space further yeah. into further subsets? You could you could draw it into, into different ways, but the, the only sensible way to do it, well, my argument doesn't really depend on this on the, on the topology of, of of this space. Now you could say, well, suppose they're not connected. So then, mm -hmm. then you can get something else that, that can happen if you have, for example, a disorder like like in, in a spin glass. So so let's let's um, let what I want to do is I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because um, most of you have done this before in in, in statistical mechanics. So 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 what I want to what I want to do now is I want to talk uh, next uh, about let's assume that we can. Um, we can take this picture for granted, and uh, and let's. Um, well, actually, I want I want to summarise it before I, before I go on. Uh, sorry, you, you you slightly randomise me. Let me collect my thoughts. So so let's 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 uh, let's ma let me make a conclusion then of what I'm what I'm trying to say here. So the conclusion of this part is that if I have h uh, non-zero, then that will bias the spins to point along the field. So um, you won't have ergodicity uh, breaking. Um, there's no symmetry breaking at all. So there's no so there's no symmetry breaking because there's no symmetry.
And then when H is equal to zero, then the uh, system is, 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 uh, has over density breaking. And we can think of this as the, uh, the, the, um, the probability of transitioning from one state to a symmetry reversed state gets uh, smaller and smaller as, uh, as, it, as h goes to zero. So, so, the, so, the, so the usual picture that physicists have, it's not really, a, it's not really right. So the physics, the physics uh, picture is that in real life, there's always some H non-zero that selects one particular direction. But uh, in the in the sort of ideal world, um, we set H is equal to zero and say that the system chooses One, uh, one, one state or another. So if we if we take so and we call that symmetry breaking. So if we take if we take that ideal world in this picture, the probability distribution is equal to now, e to the minus beta h. If your if, uh, if if your spin configurations give you let's say n greater than zero, and it's equal to zero otherwise. So it's not the Boltzmann distribution. It's a distribution that is zero in in say this part of the space and non-zero in the top part of the space. Whereas um, in, in the picture, in the real life picture over here, the probability distribution is equal to the Boltzmann distribution. And so what, this, what I've told you then is that in the infinite system limit, you, you, you have, um, you don't really have the Boltzmann distribution, at least in, in an external magnetic field equal to zero. Now remember what I told you about emergence being uh, a non-mandatory states of the system, that the system can have two possible states. So you can see, you can see that this is, uh, this is true, um, that this is true uh, here. So how does this connect to the ideas of emergence that we talked about before? So for, for if I draw the phase space of the system, so for, uh, and I'm drawing this when h is equal to zero, so when t is greater than tc, and contrast that with t less than tc, So here, I just have the system being ergodic over the whole of phase space. So there's only one probability distribution. Over here, I could have either this distribution or this distribution. So I have two probability distributions.
uh, that, that can exist. And so, so, so you have these, so, so, so the emergence is, is characterized by a symmetry breaking and, and this sort of non-uniqueness non of probability measures. And uh, so, so that, that's the way you can think about what, uh, what, what uh, emergence is in this statistical mechanical picture. So, so th this one on the right is, uh, is often used by mathematicians or mathematical physicists. And, uh, and it, it's, um, you have to literally think of different probability measures. Uh, it is also used uh, by regular physicists in dealing with disordered systems. So it turns out that to understand what happens in disordered systems like spin glasses um, and, and gels and so on, uh, this picture is, the, is really the best one, the only way to make go forward. On the other hand, if you're um, if you're not in a, in a disordered system, then uh, usually what people think about is the idea that you have an external magnetic field, and then uh, so there's no ergodicity uh, breaking, nothing complicated. And then let uh, h uh, tend to zero, and that's typically what we as physicists uh, uh, will do. Okay, so let's let's see that picture in, in practice. So the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about the uh, a uh, a level of description, um, uh, a coarse grain level of description, which is uh, which is Landau Landau theory, and. Um, so I'm going to literally um, start off um, by just literally writing writing this down, and I'm going to assume that you have uh, you have seen this before in, in in statistical in statistical physics. So so next we're going to look at the um, a, a, the Landau theory description. Of a magnet near a critical point. So, so, so Landau theory, as you as you should remember, is a, a kind of unified picture of what happens near a critical point. So it applies whatever the, the physical system is. So. So the so the so the basic idea is uh, is calculate the uh, functional form of the free energy when the magnetization is small, i.e. N is much less than one, T is close to TC, and H is close to, to zero. So, so hopefully you'll remember that, uh, that if one does that, this is what one gets. So um, the, in, in, in um, mean field theory, so let me just say Weiss mean field theory, the simplest version of it, Uh, what, what you get is the equation of state looks like this. So, um, so this is the this is the magnetization 
um, very close to the critical point. So this is called the reduced temperature. And um, so this is for a magnet. If, we, if you were to do this for the van der Waals equation, So that would be for a liquid gas transition. Uh, what you would get is this equation. I'll define the term in a minute. Pi is one plus four T plus six T eta plus three halves eta cubed. And in this equation here, so pi is the pressure over the critical pressure of the, of the, of the fluid. Uh, eta is the critical volume minus the volume over critical volume. So this is, this is the, essentially the, something like the density and uh, T is T minus TC over TC. So, so this, this describes the equation of state for, um, for a, a liquid. And where, do you, where, would you, where would you get those things from? Um, the, these these, these uh, equations of state would follow from a Gibbs free energy which uh, I'll write down like this, gamma and eta and T, and then either H or P, depending on which system you're talking about, sum gamma naught minus eta times either H or P over KBT plus one half T eta squared plus one quarter eta to the fourth. And, uh, and, and um, if I was talking about a, a, uh, a magnet, then eta would be this thing, this m, otherwise eta is equal to, for, for, to, the, to the density difference if I'm talking about a, a fluid. So, so the basic idea is that these two different systems Two different calculations can all be derived from the same uh, the, the same free energy. So so what we will what we what we say is that eta is an order parameter, and in in the case of a, of a magnet, it tells you whether or not you have a non-zero magnetization. In the case of a of a liquid, it tells you uh, the the density difference uh, um, near the co near the coexistence curve. I'm not going to say too much about the liquid case because I know that students get confused about that unless I go into great detail and explain the phase diagram of a liquid of a liquid or a fluid. So let's just really think about the uh, eta as being the order parameter, um, and and let's just think about the, the um, magnetization is the example. So in the example of magnetization, um, M is equal to zero, there is no order, i.e. as many spins point up as down. And if M is greater than zero, then more spins point up than down. And if M is less than zero, it's more down than up. And uh, so basically your cartoon picture would be something like this would be N equals zero. This would be m greater than zero, and 
this would be m less than zero. So you, you can see that in one of these, in this one, there is no order. In m equals zero, there's no order. But when it, when uh, the order parameter is positive, you actually uh, have an order in the system. And, and you can see that the order spreads throughout the system. And so we call this a, a long range order. I'm going to say a bit more about it in a minute, a little bit later. So, so the order in, uh, in M uh, goes throughout the system. And so we say it's long range. And so that gives you the idea of long range order. Now, that's a little bit glib. When we talk about long range order in a, a little bit later, a bit more precisely, I'm going to define this in terms of correlation functions. So let's just, let me just uh, make sure that you know that. So uh, later, we will make this precise. In terms of correlation functions, okay. So let's so let me just uh, so let's now just talk about uh, how this gives us a picture of uh, of emergent order and symmetry breaking. So the next thing that I want to do then is um, What I'm going to do is I'm going to call this spontaneous symmetry breaking. So let's um, so so the answer is we will we'll do it as follows. So so in it, so we'll say that um, the whole point is that near the transition. There is a unified uh, description in, uh, for both these systems. And it is not an accident. So you might wonder, why is it that in both the, um, the, the magnetic case and the liquid case, they're both very different things, but they both end up with the same kind of structure. A, a, a cubic term here, a linear term here, multiplied by T minus TC over here, and, and some other constant. Why, where did this structure come from? So we're gonna see that um, it, it's very natural to get that structure. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to first of all tell you what use this structure is, and then next lecture we'll talk about uh, how it's inevitable that you would you would get the structure. So, so the first thing we're going to do is um, is is utilize this structure. So the way I'm going to start off is I'm just going to write down the free energy, and I'm going to call it L rather than Gibbs free energy or something like that, because it's as as you're going to see, it's not really a free energy at all. Uh, so, um, so the, I'm going to call it L because this thing is going to be uh, the Landau uh, free energy. And, uh, and this is later going to be a, a Landau free energy uh, density. So, so in, this, in this picture here, uh, we're going to assume that this uh, coefficient A is a number greater than zero. B is greater than zero. Um, and they're just some, some, uh, some arbitrary uh, constants. And so the whole point about this picture 
is that if I were to draw uh, the shape of L as a function of eta, Um, above TC, it looks like this, and uh, below TC, it looks like that. And so it, it has uh, two, two minima at uh, minus e to s and plus e to s. And e to s is the spontaneous uh, magnetization or spontaneous uh, value of the order parameter. So that's the behavior. And how do we how do we know this is true? And both these pictures here are for uh, h is equal to zero. So so when t is greater than t c, um, the free energy the Landau free energy is minimized. With eta is equal to zero, and when t is less than t c, then if we solve d l by d eta is equal to zero, that's minimized. When um, uh, a t eta plus b eta cubed is equal to zero, and so that tells you that eta squared is equal to minus a t over b or equal to zero. And, and so, when, uh, so when t is less than tc, uh, that means that little t is less than zero. And, uh, and so that says that the spontaneous value of the order parameter is just plus or minus the square root of a absolute value of t over b. And so we, we, we can see that, that is, uh, that's what happens um, below, below tc. And so uh, th these are so th this solution is thermodynamically stable. And um, and we know that's true because from the picture we can see that these are the global minima. Uh, on the other hand, the solution, with um, eta is equal to zero, this solution is, is not thermodynamically stable. Because it's a, a, a um, it's not a global minimum. And you can see that over here. Okay, so um, so so that's that's the that that is that is the that is our picture. So um, what is the physical meaning of um, of of L? So the answer is. It's definitely not the thermodynamic free energy. So it's not Gibbs. Or Helmholtz free energies. Which comes as a surprise to some people. Um, the reason the reason it the reason is because this um, the, 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 this, this, this shape, particularly the shape below TC, uh, violates uh, con convexity. So, so, so there's a there's a theorem that you can prove. Which is that the uh, thermodynamic free energies Must be a, a convex function, and in the in the in the case that we have here, 
So let me just sketch this picture. Okay, so this is the, this is our picture with um, our an eater. So this this part of the uh, of the free energy is uh, is not convex. This part here. And, and, and so why isn't it? What it should be, the real thermodynamic free energy does something like this. So the, this, the, what I've drawn in gold, that is convex. And that's what the, the real free energy uh, would be. In, in this non-convex region, it must, be, it must be a convex function uh, in order for there to be uh, stability. i.e. a positive susceptibility. So, so, so this double well potential that you see all the time in, uh, in, in, in physics is, um, is not, um, is actually cannot be true if these things are thermodynamic uh, free, uh, free energies. So, so then what actually is this free energy? And so I'm going to explain to you what it, what it actually is um, by, by using a picture of an, of, of an Ising model. So, the, so, the, so, the, so what my claim is, is that actually um, L is the uh, free energy uh, density for a coarse grained order parameter. So, so we're now going to start uh, putting into practice all the stuff that I told you about to do with different uh, different levels of description. So so let's uh, let's draw uh, a picture so that you can you can you can see what what that really means. So let's start off with a microscopic configuration. I'm going to call this microscopic configuration number one. So it's going to look something like this. I'm going to pretend that I'm in one direction one dimension. So here is space like this. And I'm going to draw the, um, the, the spin values at that, at that point in space. And so I'm going to get something that looks like this. And um, I'm just going to make this up as I, as I go along. So that might be a, a snapshot uh, of the system. And uh, that might be one snapshot. If I took a, a, another snapshot, Sometime later, so I might get a completely different configuration. I don't know, something, something like that. So I'm going to call that one microscopic configuration number two. And you could imagine there being being uh, being being many many more like that. So if I've drawn this correctly, you'll 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 see that these uh, these configurations have some kind of local order, not long range order, but local order. So here is a patch of locally ordered spins. And probably there's one there's one another one over here. And so you can see that the system will be locally ordered, but, but globally it may or may not be locally ordered, who, who can say. So obviously this, this function, as I go from point to point in space, it's not, it's not really a function at all. It's a very discontinuous up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down picture. And so what, you, what we would like to have is we would like to have a, uh, we would like to A smoothly varying uh, 
uh, variable. It describes the order in the system. And so the way I'm going, to, the way I'm, the way uh, that I'm going to do that is I'm going to imagine that I take a, a little a little block uh, like like so with some some length scale a lambda, and I compute what is the the average magnetization in this sliding window. And then I'm going to take this window, I'm literally just going to slide it along uh, in, in space. And so uh, what I claim is that if I do that, I'm going to get this picture. So I'm going to I'm going to call I'm going to call this this variable m of lambda of x. And so now x is a continuous variable, and this thing is going to look something like well I don't know what it's going to look like but let's say it's some something like this. So this is um, so 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 this m lambda is a is defined at a point in space and it's basically one over the number of spins in my in my window, the sum over i in the window. Of the actual uh, microscopic spins, and and it, it can be the case that uh, both microscopic pictures one and two may have the same. M lambda of x. So you can, I don't know if it's true with the particular examples that I, I drew here, but but you can certainly imagine that uh, if I if I made uh, some spin flips on a scale much smaller than my capital lambda, it's not going to change uh, the picture that I get for m lambda as a function of x. So so then you, what we have is is a picture like this where there's an m lambda of x. At some large scale, and then many different microscopic configurations, which, when I coarse grain, give me the same large scale m lambda of x. So this process of averaging over a, a, a window um, is called coarse graining. And, and you can see that it's, uh, it's much easier if you, if you wanted to know how to describe the system, you'd much rather describe it by m lambda of x as a nice smooth continuous function. You can differentiate it. Whereas m i is not smooth, is not any of the above. And so what that means is we would rather we would rather have this than than this. So Next time, what I'll uh, I'll talk about is um, is given our description, our coarse grain description, uh, 
what um, probability distribution governs the uh, probability of getting a configuration M lambda of X in thermal equilibrium. And we'll see that that's a, a generalization of, uh, of the Landau free energy density that I showed you before. Um, and we will, we will then uh, introduce um, the idea of functional calculus so that we can start to make literally simple field theory models of this kind of uh, statistical mechanical system. So I'm going to stop there and I'll be happy to take questions. So let me just stop.